Yeah, so last week they talked about uh, hope for the future. And I thought I'd continue on with that and maybe move to some of our American forefathers and what, what they believe as well. But first, <clears throat> I thought I'd start off with a story. Does anybody want to hear a story? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay, all right, you want to hear a story? Good, because I like to tell stories. Lattimore and Ridley. They didn't just look down at their feet, but they looked at what was underneath their feet. It was a pile of dry wood underneath their feet. And the day had finally come, try as they may, to, to avoid it. The day had finally come. Would they be strong enough? Would, would they be man enough? Or would they fail in their mission? The year was 1555. Queen Mary sat on the throne. Mary Tudor, known to history as Bloody Mary, not because she liked to drink cocktails at the local pub there in England, but Bloody Mary because she would execute so many Protestant pastors who stood up and preached the truth of God's word. Lattimore and Ridley, they were two of those pastors. For weeks they had looked out of the Tower of London they had seen as, as pastor after pastor were marched through the streets and they were executed. So they both looked down at their feet again, looked at that dry wood. They knew that their turn had finally come. There was a brief moment though, very brief, when, when Ridley thought, Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have made those, those Catholic theologians look so silly in front of everyone in the trial that they put us through. Maybe I should have, have made some concessions there. Ridley had made a, a brilliant defense of the faith, made his Catholic opponents just look like children. I mean, what other choice did he leave them but to, to have him and them? Lattimore, he, he wouldn't even argue with those mass mockers, he said. He wouldn't even give a defense. And so the day had come. Mm. They were led out of the Tower of London, led before a large crowd of people, given one last chance to recant. And they stood up and they said, we will not recant. And so the jailer, he chained them to the stake. They would tie a bag of gunpowder to each one of their necks. Lattimore and Ridley, they took one last look down at the sticks beneath their feet as, as the flames started to build underneath. And as they stood back to back, Lattimore, he would say those famous words, still heard in history, be strong, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. For this day we will light such a candle that will never be put out. So that fire would get bigger and bigger. That gunpowder would be ignited that was around their necks. Lattimore and Ridley, they would be believed. But what also was ignited then was a Reformation fire in England that would spread throughout the whole country. It would leap over and spread into America in the new world and here we are today in the Reformed Presbyterian Church the candle is still lit here Lattimore and Ridley so last week we had talked about this great hope for the future that started maybe we can go back to the 4th century with a man named Athanasius everywhere and, and in fact everything opposed to Christ 
is daily dwindling and losing power while all parts of the world are being illuminated by the knowledge of the true and living God. So we talked about Athanasius and then came in the next century came Augustine who wrote that famous book entitled The City of God and in this book it talked about how there's this great battle between the city of God and the city of man and as God's people are faithful to him and faithful to the work of Christ that the city of God will grow and grow and and the city of man will diminish and and diminish and then we talked about John Calvin our man John Calvin came along who loved Augustine and he agreed that that this kingdom of God will continue to grow and expand because Christ is ruling with the rod of his mouth meaning the word of God right and, and that with that rod he will destroy the kingdoms of this world and all their strength and all their power and then came our favorite I hope right the Presbyterian Church our favorite John Knox then came John Knox John Knox wrote this book of discipline which would lay out a road map for a Christian society with divided power so that we wouldn't have another tyrant like Bloody Mary oppressing the people oppressing God's word and so he would lay out this idea of, of divided power and that idea would spread then to America all right and so here we are we're going to continue on that was last week so we'll continue on with maybe some of this this hope for the future that some of our early American ancestors had here and you'll remember one of the first groups to come to the America's shores was in 1620. Does anybody remember who that group was that came here? I learned about them in uh, like third grade. The Pilgrims, say the Pilgrims, the Pilgrims in 1620, the Pilgrims, they would bring the gospel to America. They had this great hope, and they stated, according to the Mayflower Compact, stated they came for the glory of God of the Christian faith why they came here and if you remember in third grade history class at least I don't, I don't, I don't know maybe now it's seventh grade or maybe they don't even talk about it now, I don't know. but third grade that first winter in Plymouth boy it was rough times for the Pilgrims right it was pretty rough times they named it Diamond Time that's what it was named because they lost almost half of their number there that first winter for the Pilgrims at, at the Plymouth Colony and you might think the pilgrims, you know, may have started to believe that, boy, maybe they had the wrong idea about what they were doing here. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they got it wrong. But they had this great hope. They had this great hope that they were starting something glorious here in America. William Bradford, the governor of the Plymouth Colony, he wrote about the pilgrims' purpose in founding this new colony. He said there was... There was a great hope and an inward zeal of, of laying some good foundation, or at least to make some way thereunto for the propagation and advancing of the gospel, or the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, even though they should be but stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. And so the pilgrims, they believed that that they were advancing the kingdom of Christ and and somehow this small colony that they would start would be a stepping stone in in this great work that was yet to come and I wonder maybe if any of us here have, have ever started a ministry or an organization or uh, maybe even a business I don't know with with this same kind of hope that that when when you started something you said well i'm going to do the the best for for starting this thing because i believe it's going to be a stepping stone in the advancement of the kingdom of of christ like, can you imagine that these people coming over here and doing that you'll remember another group that came 
to Massachusetts, we had the, uh, the Massachusetts, or we had Plymouth Colony, and then there was another group that came in. So they were separate, but they were kind of similar groups. Anybody remember that group that came to Massachusetts there? The Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritans. I remember the Puritans. Yeah, it was the Puritans. The Puritans would come to Massachusetts. And one of their first leaders of the Puritan colony was John Winthrop. I don't know if anybody remembers that name. And John Winthrop, he would preach this famous sermon about a city on a hill. And he would say in his sermon, talking about this city on a hill, that we shall see much more of God's wisdom, God's power, and God's truth. So we thought that they were establishing this city on this on a hill, this light of the world. And, and his expectation was that this new colony, or maybe even this new country, that they were going to go and start would be a great light to the whole world, which would grow. And this Christian society, he believed that this Christian society would be copied all over the world. Because everyone would see how glorious this this colony was, this Christian community was, it'd be like a light to the whole world. I mean, that's pretty amazing talk, right? When was the last time you heard someone say that they were going to start a ministry or an organization or start something because they would hope it would be so powerfully used by God that it would be copied all over the world? Like, what a hope that they had then. And so that was in, that was the 1600s. And then would come, in America would come the revival of the 1700s, the Great Awakening. You'll remember one of, one of the most famous guys from the Great Awakening. I spoke about this man before. I think I even spoke about him on July 4th. This man said to be one of the greatest evangelists that ever had come to America. It's believed that more people personally saw this man than, than even George Washington because he would ride through the colonies so much, preach so often. He preached 30,000 sermons during his lifetime over the course of about 30 years. That's about three sermons a day. He would ride by horseback and preach sermons. Does anybody remember that, the name of that guy? George Whitfield, yeah, George Whitfield, right? Remember George Whitfield. George Whitfield, he would have this this same hope. He would have this same hope about the future. Let's look. George Whitfield, he would say, "The scriptures encourage us to expect, to hope, to long, and pray for larger and more extensive showers of divine influence." That any former age have ever yet experienced. For are we not taught to pray that we may be filled with the fullness of God and to wait for a glorious epoch when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas? Do not all the saints on earth and all the spirits of just men made perfect in heaven, may all the angels and archangels about the throne of the Most High God night and day, join in this united cry, Lord Jesus, let thy kingdom come. That was his, his great hope there. I mean, when was the last time we prayed? Lord, I want to see your kingdom come like it is in heaven. I want to see it here on earth, see it spreading and growing. And this was coming from the man, George Whitfield, who would see in his lifetime would see the greatest revival in American history. And he's he's saying, like, we need more. I'm praying for more. This is going to grow and expand and keep growing. I don't know if you remember when I told the story. There's an account of George Whitfield about a man who's going to see George Whitfield and him and his wife. They He comes in early from the fields from plowing, and he said there's this great dust cloud he saw out there of all these people. It was like rush hour traffic and the horses and the carriage just going to see George Whitfield. And, and it was just like mania out there. These people just 
dying to go and see him preach and hear, hear from George Whitfield. It was great. And in the same day as George Whitfield would come a man, I think I've talked about him before too, would come another man who was called the greatest pastor, the greatest philosopher, the greatest theologian, the greatest author that America has ever produced. He even preached to be what's called the greatest sermon that's ever been preached in America. Does anybody remember who that guy was? I talked about him before. Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards, he would have this great hope as well about the kingdom of God expanding and growing on the earth. Jonathan Edwards, he would write a book where he would kind of lay out some of these thoughts great hope that he had. And here's what the book was called. It was called, A Humble Attempt to Promote Explicit Agreement and Visible Union of God's People in Extraordinary Prayer. What a title, right? I mean, who couldn't be hopeful with a title like that? Now, if I was his PR person, I might say, listen, John, maybe uh, maybe we should shorten that up a little bit, get a little more catchy, like, hey, how about your best life now, or something like that. You know, like, that pretty catchy title, but it's a pretty long title for a book. But anyway, in this book, he would lay out that, that he believed that the gospel would expand, grow, and would, and would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. He said in his book that a time would come when there will be not one nation remaining in the world which shall not embrace the true religion. He said Isaiah 60, 12, no doubt demonstrates that the nation which will not serve God will perish. Heathen idolatry will be destroyed. Jeremiah 10, 11, while, while this earth and these heavens remain. And Isaiah 60, 12, well, that's kind of a small print. I'll just read. For the, it says, for the nations or kingdom that will not serve you will perish. It will be utterly ruined. Jeremiah 10, 11, Tell them this, these gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. And so Edwards, Edwards is saying here that he believed this will happen. Honor that as the church goes about its business of doing what Christ has called us to do, that we will bring this in. He said that heresies and infidelities and superstitions, they will all be abolished. That the kingdoms of the Antichrist and of Islam shall be overthrown. That the veil that blinds the eyes of the Jews shall be withdrawn. Almost all Protestants, when we talk about the Antichrist, uh, almost all Protestants at this time, back in the 1700s, they thought the Antichrist was the Pope. They most of them believe the Antichrist was actually the Pope. But John Adams, he, he had this, this belief that things, the kingdom of God was going to grow and expand. And he even had this hope and belief, this would be awesome, uh, that there will be one united church, that there will not be different denominations, but as the kingdom of God grows and expands and takes over, there'll be one united church all over the world and he thought that this church would probably be you're going to love this he thought this church would probably be Presbyterian and then and Jonathan Edwards wasn't even a Presbyterian he was a Congregationalist but he thought that this church would be Presbyterian here's what he here's what I don't even love this here's what he had to say about it he says as to my subscribing to the substance of the Westminster Confession there, there would be no difficulty. And as to the Presbyterian government, I have long been perfectly out of conceit. I mean, that means like he's kind of ashamed of our, meaning the Congregationalists, our, our unsettled and independent and confused way of church government in this land. And the Presbyterian way has ever appeared to me the most agreeable to the Word of God. Well, of course it is, right? Of course, right? Of course, right? Of course it is. And so, and so Edwards, he would help to spark 
the modern missionary movement. He would publish the journals of his son-in-law, David Brainerd. Does anybody remember that name, David Brainerd? He would publish the journals of his son-in-law, who was the great missionary to the American Indians, David Brainerd, who he worked so hard, he worked himself into an early grave. I think he died in like his early or his later 20s because he was just so on fire to spread the gospel to the Native Americans there in New England. That those journals that Jonathan Edwards would publish of his son-in-law, they they would be read by another man, William Carey. He would read this book and, and he would be inspired to go to India and to spread the gospel in India. And he would write a book called An Inquiry to Use Means. And, and many would be inspired by William Carey's book to go and do world missions. They're one of those men who would be inspired was David Livingston. I've talked about David Livingston. I don't know if I've ever talked about David Livingston. But David Livingston, he would read this book and he would be inspired to go to Africa. He would say, I'm, I'm trying to establish the Lord's kingdom in regions wider by far than Scotland. David Livingston, he was a Scottish, Scottish man. He says, fever seems to forbid, but I shall work for the glory of Christ's kingdom, fever or no fever. And if you'll remember when I talked about David Livingston, what it was last year or so, you know, he, he was the great missionary to Africa. He suffered just extreme hardship there in Africa, nearly died of jungle fever almost 30 times, but he would just press on for, for the kingdom of Christ. He had that, that great hope that God's kingdom would expand and grow. I know we're kind of concentrating on our American forefathers here, but I thought I, I, I thought it was worth mentioning that famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon. Anybody remember heard that name, Charles Spurgeon? God used so mightily in the late 1800s. They even called Charles Spurgeon the Prince of Preachers. Uh, he was a contemporary of D.L. Moody. I think even Pastor Sandy told a pretty funny story about how the first time it was D.L. Moody came to Charles Spurgeon's house, Charles Spurgeon opened the door and he had a cigar in his hand. And D.L. Moody said, Mr. Spurgeon, you smoke? And Charles Spurgeon said, Mr. Moody, you're fat. And so, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, Charles Spurgeon, uh, he would preach, what, 3,600 sermons, published 49 volumes of commentaries, just the prince of preachers, he's called. He would have this hope as well. He would say, David was not a believer in the theory that the world was going to get worse and worse. And not so do we expect, but we, we look for a day when the dwellers in all lands shall learn righteousness, shall trust in the Savior, shall worship thee alone, O God, and shall glorify thy name. Wow, what a hope. What a hope even Charles Spurgeon and the Prince of Preachers. And so, as we wrap up, to believe that, that Christ rules in victory and his kingdom will, will grow and expand as, as the waters cover the sea. And as David writes, as David writes in Psalm 110 that Christ is seated at the right hand of God and God is making Christ's enemies a footstool under his feet.